Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Artemis Kirk, University Librarian, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Casey McElvain Memorial Lecture, tonight featuring the program Project Rebirth. Before we actually begin the program, I'd like to say a very special thank you to the members of the Casey and McElvain families who are here this evening. Thomas and Thomas Casey and Christine, Frank Casey and Gabriella, and Nancy McElvain Del Genio. This Casey McElvain Endowed Lecture Library Fund was established in memory of Francis L. Casey Jr. and in honor of the Reverend Donald W. McElvain, both of whom were Georgetown University graduates. The fund is a joint gift of the late Roseanne McEl McElvain Casey and Nancy McElvain Del Genio. Without their generosity, programs like this would not be possible. Please join me in asking the Casey McElvain family to stand and to thank them for their generosity. Would you please stand. Thank you all very, very much. I'd also like very much to thank Emily Minton and Katie Thomas of the Lowinger Library staff and our videographers, Mike Madison, and everybody from the library who have made this possible, including Barrington Baines, who is videotaping tonight's event. Today is the 16th anniversary of the devastation that we know of as 9-11. Current students at Georgetown were likely toddlers when this happened. We are presenting tonight's Project Rebirth as a memorial to the victims of that horrendous event, as well as to the bravery of the women and men who risked their own lives to help others. Our featured program is led by Georgetown University alumnus Brian Rafferty. Project Rebirth is an organization dedicated to supporting the survivors of catastrophic events, including the September 11th, 2001 World Trade Center attacks. Project Rebirth's films facilitate powerful lessons on how human beings can build resilience personally, professionally, and in their communities and organizations. The collection of films features nine short videos that depict nine very different journeys following the catastrophic events of September 11th, as well as a full-length film entitled Rebirth, which you will see a portion of shortly. All of these films are now part of the Georgetown University Library's Digital Georgetown Repository and are available to the entire campus community as well as to the public. I'd like to take a moment to thank the librarians and staff from the Library Information Technology Department and especially the Digital Services Unit for all of their hard work in making these very important films accessible to our community, in particular Suzanne Chase and Salva Ismail. Thank you very, very much. You will shortly see some video clips but I'm going to tell you a little bit about Brian Rafferty, who will then speak immediately following the video. He serves as the chairman for Project Rebirth and is, is leading the strategic development of the Project Rebirth Center and related educational and therapeutic programs for those who respond to mass casualty events. Building on his more than 25 years of experience in strategic communications, Brian is actively involved in the development of this national grassroots campaign. A specialist in investor relations and financial communications, Brian co-founded Taylor Rafferty in 1982. Since then, he has assisted numerous global clients in virtually every aspect of their international capital markets activities. Brian has a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, is a member of the CFA Institute, the New York Society of Securities Analysts, and many, many other organizations. It will be a pleasure to have him speak and introduce the rest of the panel to you, a very distinguished panel whom we thank warmly for coming tonight. And we now will proceed to show you films from Rebirth.
I still haven't cleaned out the closets, Sergio's side, his drawers. Like, I can't do it. Every once in a while, I get that moment where I just kind of look and I say, oh, I remember that shirt. I can't explain it, but like, my heart hurts. It's like a feeling right here. And I just think about my mom and it hurts. Every morning when I leave the house and I go in, to t I always tuck the girls in. I always think of Michael, like every day I do it, tucking his two girls in, because he, he missed out on that. I would say to myself, it could be worse. So I think that's how I go get by. I get very frustrated if I drop something, I can't pick it up, I get frustrated. But I say, you know what, then use the other hit. So I'm learning to cope with everything I have. Just like everybody else, I wish I could have stood there and held the towers up. I'm, I'm here, they're not survivor's guilt. I mean, it's... I can't believe it, but it's been four years, you know, and I've learned to live, uh, live without her. I still miss her every day. I still think about her every day, but I have learned to live without her. I still am committed to the thing I said the day I got there, that I was gonna find my brother, and rebuild this site, stay here until it's completely done. As traumatizing as it was, coming to the realization that you can open up your heart even more to allow new love to come in, that takes some letting go. But when you do, it's it's profound. From this day forward. So I've had some practice over 10 years talking after that film, <laughs> but it's not the easiest thing to do. And the same thing happens every time. I carefully craft remarks and write it out and get very precise and then I never stick to them because it doesn't feel right not to speak from the heart when you watch that. So I'm going to wing it, half wing it. Um, thank you, Artemis, for introducing me. And I have to echo your thanks to your whole team. They are really good and did a, did a great job. And um, in organizing this, but also with Salwa and Suzanne, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're here, um, beyond the very obvious. And we're here to mark a very uh, important day and to remember. But what all this is about is trying to make something good out of something horrific. And um, to be here in the library and to mark the films being uh, made available for part of that effort, that, that's, that's why I'm here also. And um, I'm very glad everybody got to see that small selection because you, um, if you can try to imagine that there are 
obviously the feature length documentary film. There's nine of those. There's a, an immersive exhibit at uh, the 9-11 Museum that millions of people have watched. But there's also hundreds of hours of the underlying interviews, literally hundreds of hours of, of the, the nine people that you saw at the end, not, not simply the, the, the five that made it into the feature film. That to my knowledge, that is still an absolutely unique resource, that there is no record of people on an annual basis discussing and sharing their journey um, recovering from trauma and grief. And before I was here today, I was in meeting with Salwa and Suzanne um, about those will be the next component that's available along with the transcripts. And um, that's actually a really big step forward because then it makes the underlying content available to be more widely shared for educational and other purposes. So that kind of excites me after 10 years of, of all this that this can still have meaning. And why does it have meaning um, 16 years after the event? Because we have come a long way and I am going to meet my five minute deadline and the three gentlemen that are going to follow me are way, way, way more qualified to talk about that. But we have come a long way since 9-11 in learning how to help people be strong in the face of trauma, resilience, whatever you want to call it. But we still have a really long way to go. And anything that we can do to help that process, which Bill and I have talked about this, is about sharing what we know is an important contribution. And that's really what the films are about. Um, for me, it's a wonderful, amazing thing to have uh, Bill and General Casey and Randy up here because they represent or they actually embody the three communities that Project Rebirth is focused on serving, which is military and veterans, educators, and first responders. So I'm going to get off here because I want them to talk about it. And also I have a little aphorism in life that I try to follow, which is lead, follow, or get out of the way. So I think I should get out of the way of one of the great leaders of our generation who are going to follow me, which is General Casey. And I'm going to read you just a small selection of his accomplishments, because if, if I read the whole thing, we would be here until very late tonight. I'm sure many of you know him, so I'm just going to read it. Apologies, because I will skip something if I don't. So General George Casey enjoyed a 41-year career in the U.S. Army following his graduation from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in 1970, accomplished soldier and an authority on strategic leadership. As Army Chief of Staff from 2007 to 2011, he led one of our largest and most complex organizations during one of the most extraordinary periods in our history. He's widely credited with restoring balance to a war-weary war army and leading the transition to keep it relevant in the 21st century. Prior to this, from July 2004 to February 2007, he commanded the multinational force Iraq, a coalition of more than 30 countries where he guided uh, the mission through its toughest days. It's really quite astonishing, all this. Currently, he lectures internationally on leadership uh, to the leaders of national and multinational corporations at the Johnson School of Management, Cornell University, and other business schools. George is getting embarrassed now because he doesn't like all these. <laughs> I could go on. Um, all right, I'm going to stop. He's also, the, he's also the chairman of the board of the USO, and I'm going to get off and hand over to John. You, yeah, you, you ha go sit down. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Lead follower, get out of the way. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction. I didn't get through the whole thing. Okay. Uh, to the Casey and McElvain families, no relation, I don't think, but we should talk. <laughs> And I think Frank and Don would be very pleased to know that uh, one of their lectures uh, is going toward resilience, and, and, and we're talking about military resilience, and both of them, I think, were World War II vets, as I recall. So, um, I, I have to be a little careful here tonight. As I look around the audience, I see one of my college classmates from 1970, Dave Burgess, and my driver, really, my driver of about 15 years in the Army, was my driver in Iraq, was actually wounded at, Went back, recovered, and then came back to Iraq, Gene Sizemore. So, 
We, we have an old saying in, in the Army that nothing screws up a good war story like an eyewitness. So, there, so there's two, two eyewitnesses here tonight, so I have to, have to be careful. Um, it, it's September 11th, so I mean, it's, it, it's still hard for me to believe that it was 16 years ago today that 19 terrorists murdered 2,977 people in an hour and 40 minutes. And they inflicted huge economic damage on New York and on our country. And they caused trauma in the citizens of New York and the surrounding states that, that we're still dealing with today. I had a sister in Midtown and two sisters-in-law in the World Trade Center complex. And over the years of my military service, when something would happen in the world, they'd always call and check on me. See, see if I was gone or what I was doing. That day I was calling to check on them. And, and I knew my world had changed forever. And, and as a military person, it, it, it's even harder, harder to believe that since that time, two and a half million men and women have served in Iraq and Afghanistan and, serve, and served very well. Almost 7,000 of them have lost their lives. And they've left more than 25,000 surviving family members. I wear this bracelet of a sergeant who was killed in Iraq uh, during my, under my command to remind me constantly of the human cost of war. It's Sergeant First Class Rand Lamerson. And his wife, Dana, and his children, Kelsey and Evan, are still struggling with his loss today and he was killed 10 years ago. Um, more than 52,000 men and women have been wounded. About 10,000 of them seriously enough to require long-term care. Another almost 500,000 have been diagnosed with traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress, the signature wounds of this war. Now, now, most of that is traumatic brain injury, and most of that is mild to moderate, which is, which is a concussion. So it's not as, as devastating as it sounds, but combat affects everybody. And we had a lot of catch-up work to do in the Army uh, when, the, when the war started. Because what, I, what I, I didn't realize it until I was confronted with something, but you don't get post-traumatic stress in training. And so we had a lot of small wars, but we didn't ne never had a sustained war. And so the generation of leaders guiding our army after September 11th had never really had to deal with it. And, and I got my wake up call when I was the vice chief of staff of the army, the number two. And one day my staff came running in with the hair on fire saying, the shrinks are gonna go out tomorrow and they have this terrible report that says morale is low in, in, in combat and it's, it's all terrible. And I must admit my first response was, who the heck sh sent the shrinks over there without an escort? <laughs> but, we, but I got them in and, and they did what, what you'd expect them to do. They had gone over there and done an assessment of the impact of combat on the troops. And it was a wake-up call that we, we had a lot that we, that we had to learn. And when I went over to Iraq, I requested them to come every year and do that assessment. And we got a lot of very, very good uh, data on that. Um, during the time I was there, I saw the impact of combat uh, firsthand on, on the men and women who were there. And it wasn't just the soldiers. It was the leaders having to deal with the loss of their soldiers. And everyone puts on a good face for the general but you can't hide some things. And I, I still remember vividly visiting a, a, a brigade commander, a colonel, who'd lost a young captain the night before. It was his best company commander. And, and he was visibly moved by that. And, and he's still dealing with the loss today. So as you can imagine, when I came back from Iraq, it, it was top of mind. And, and it got even more top of mind when I read two studies. Now, when you become the chief of staff of the Army, everybody in the Army that has a project writes a paper about it and they put them in notebooks, and they put the notebooks in a truck, and they back the truck up to your house, and you try to read all these things so you can figure it out. As I was sifting through that, two reports stuck in my mind. One was the Army Personnel, Annual Army Personnel Survey. It was in April 2011, 
And a finding was that 90% of the men and women surveyed would not get behavioral health care because they thought it would impact their career. 90%. 2011. A couple of days later, I read this other report from the doctor saying we should expect 10 to 12 percent of the men and women who deployed to combat to return with post-traumatic stress on the first deployment. On the second, 15 to 17. On the third, 19 to 20. So I put those two together and said, we, we have to do something. So we immediately started a program to educate people about post-traumatic stress. I mean, we, we had read about it, but, but candidly, at that time, we really didn't know it if we saw it. And I thought about a sergeant who was, really, who was in my platoon when I was a lieutenant in 1971 in Germany. And he was a terrific soldier. But he was an alcoholic. And he came to me as a staff sergeant, and over time, because of his alcohol problems, was reduced all the way down to a private. And as I look back on it now, I said, the poor guy was probably suffering from post-traumatic stress. But at the time, he was just an alcoholic. So we had an awful lot to do. We, we, we began, um, after, we, after we, we started, we did the education part, we realized that we had to change people's behavior if we were going to make real change stick in the Army. So we pulled together some of the best minds in the, company, in the country. Marty, Professor Dr. Marty Seligman from University of Pennsylvania, uh, Richard Carmona, who was a former Surgeon General of the uh, United States, and a few others, and we brought them all in and said, we need your help. We, we need you to put a program to help us make the soldiers that we are sending to combat more able to deal with the challenges that we're confronting with. And then the fact that we didn't have that then was appalling to me because a leader always tries to make sure that the, their people have the tools they need to succeed. And we weren't giving our troops the tools they needed to succeed. And I'd ask the staff, I said, tell me how many, what programs we have to assess post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Tell me how, pro how many programs we have to treat them, and then tell me how many programs we have to prevent them. No surprise. Tons of programs to assess, tons of programs to treat, one program to prevent. And it was called Battle Mind, and it was taught by the doctors, uh, and it wasn't ingrained in the Army. And so we had to, we had to put together our own program, uh, and we did that. It was called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. Um, and we instituted it in 2009. I can talk a little bit more about it in the questions and, and answers if you like. Uh, but suffice to say, we implemented the program in 2009, and I looked at the survey, the same annual survey that asked the question, would you get behavioral health care if you needed it? And the number had gone from 90% to 50%. Now, that's still 500,000 people that wouldn't get help, but it was, a, it was a big dent, and this program had an awful lot to do with it. Um, I retired in 2011, and shortly thereafter is when I came in contact with Project Rebirth and Brian. Uh, I was cycling with a group called Ride to Recovery, and they used cycling as a way to help wounded soldiers recover, one way, one way to help them recover. And the... <laughs> person in charge, they decided, wouldn't it be a great idea if on the 10th anniversary of September 11th, we ride from Ground Zero to Shanksville to the Pentagon, 570 miles. <clears throat> oh, sure, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, so I signed up. There was about 350 of us, and we left from Liberty Park, which is directly across the river from Ground Zero, and rode all the way out to Shanksville and then to the Pentagon. It, it was a long ride. Uh, and I learned a lot about resilience. For me personally, it was, it was physical resilience. Um, but, I, but I watched the, the, the men and women that were there and watched the, the impact of being around others uh, that they could relate to uh, and the significant impact uh, that that made. On one of the toughest days of the ride, I was, I, we were, it was about it was a 90-mile loot leg. We were going over our second mountain range. It was 43 degrees, and it was drizzling. It was miserable. And so I'm, I'm in my lowest gear. I'm pedaling. I'm looking at the, at the speedometer, and it's, you know, it says four miles an hour. I can walk that fast. But I'm pedaling as hard as I can going up this mountain. And I'll be honest, I, I was whimpering to myself. And, and I hear someone coming up behind me. 
And I heard a soldier say, come on, sir, you can do it. And I looked down, and he had one leg. His name was Juan Carlos Hernandez, and he was, uh, took his Chinook helicopter, took an RPG in the door where he was the door gunner, lost his right leg. Well, once Juan Carlos went by me, I said, yes, General, you can do it. And I motored up the hill. But that's, that's something that's also called post-traumatic growth that a lot of people don't talk about. Everybody looks at the negative side. But if, but if 10 to 18 percent of the people that deploy have post-traumatic stress, the, the vast majority of the rest grow. And they're stronger because of the experience in combat, because they've done the hardest thing a human can do and they've succeeded at it. And, and I think that's, that's important. Um, since I've retired, uh, I, I'm looking back at what we tried to do in the Army uh, and watching what, what, what's going on with veterans around the country now. Um, I can tell you the government cannot do everything. They, they just can't. The, in, the individual problems of men and women who serve are so diverse that the government couldn't hope to do it. And that's why organizations like Project Rebirth are so absolutely important because our men and women who serve the country so well uh, d deserve that, that kind of support. Um, now, if I could, since I'm a Georgetown graduate and a Georgetown and a veteran, uh, I'd just say a couple, a couple of words about the veteran program here at Georgetown. Um, Jack DeJoy asked me uh, at the June board meeting if I would stand up a, uh, a committee of the board uh, to look at veteran activities uh, and support here at Georgetown. And, and, and so I, we're in the process of setting, of setting that up. Uh, but there are over 700 veterans and active duty military and spouses that attend Georgetown, and, and they bring to the university almost $20 million a year. Uh, and and they're, they, they do exceedingly well. We've just had two, two, uh, or two uh, welcome ceremonies, one over at the School of Continuing Studies, one here on main campus, uh, to welcome this, this year's class of, of veterans in there. One of the veterans is a guy named Tim Brown. And there's a Tim Brown in the movie that's a different Tim Brown. He is a triple amputee, uh, but he is a wheelchair rider, uh, and he's enrolled in Georgetown in the business school. His hair is a little long for my liking, but, he's, but, but I think he's going to do just fine. Um, uh, suffice it to say, we're going we're, we're to look at how we make Georgetown the acknowledged leader in support uh, to the men and women who serve the country so well. And, and even beyond that, how we make Georgetown in, in the acknowledged leader in the research and education about veteran opportunities and veteran issues. And, and I think that's where the real opportunity will be. We're, we're in a great place here in the nation's capital, uh, and, and I think we could have a huge impact uh, on that. Uh, so with that, I, I will like to introduce the Vice Provost uh, for Education here at Georgetown. Ren, Ren has more titles than I did when I was the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, but he helped create the Project Rebirth Educational Initiative, and he's going to tell us about that to, right now. So thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Artemis. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, the great uh, artist and writer Anna Devere Smith was here in November, just a couple of weeks after the election. And one of the things she said in response to a question that evening, someone was asking about how do we move forward? What's the role of education? She said, truly improving education will take a moral imagination to come out of our homes and care about the person around the corner. So that's what I think is the great power of the Project Rebirth footage the hours, the hundreds of hours of interview footage, that when, when one watches the interviews, dwells inside the interviews, one has to come out of one's home and start to care about the person around the corner. 
I think that's their power from an educational standpoint. So I've been lucky enough to hang around uh, Project Rebirth for maybe 10 years or now, or more now. Um, Brian is so good at looping people in and then no matter how much you try to get out, you keep getting pulled back to quote a famous movie. And I uh, was pleased really early on to start to teach with the Project Rebirth archival footage very early, a couple of different courses, but none more powerful than using them in a first year writing course, which I love teaching first year writing. Sometimes it feels like that's your last chance to actually teach people something. And I would say that I, I always thought how I, that I wanted to use the rebirth footage for at least three different reasons. One was to get students to slow down. Right? I think all three of these are even more poignant today than they were many years ago when I was teaching with the footage. So to get students to slow down, to pay attention to language, to pay attention to who's talking, to listen and to re-listen, and to think about how every utterance matters. I remember this great line that one of the students just noted in a blog post when Nick, at one point in the interview, sighed before answering. And uh, the student wrote, he sighed as if this was the millionth time he'd told this story. The second thing that I wanted students to get from it is a sense of empathy. I don't think there's anything more important that we can do as educators at this moment in history than help them to develop a very poignant sense of critical empathy. And for me, one of the things that empathy means is helping them see that what they thought was simple is actually very complex, or who they thought was simple is actually very complex. And then the third thing, and I never really used this word in my own head several years ago, but this was the only word I could think of in the last day or two thinking about this talk, is desensitization. The fear of desensitization of us all, especially the rising generation, becoming numb to tragedy, numb to catastrophe, numb to extremity, numb to the person around the corner or across the globe. So with that in mind, I want to read the first of two passages from things that my students wrote about working with the footage many years ago. The first was something that one of my students blogged the day that Brian came to class and showed the film was long from being out, but this was the 17-minute so-called trailer. But there was a lot of footage in it. So one of the students, she blogs, I felt like I had gotten over September 11th. Isn't that terrible? I know the profound impact it had on the lives of so many people, but I thought that I had finally situated the tragedy in a place in my mind where I could control and anticipate my response to it. As it turns out, I'm not as numb as I thought to it as I'm not as numb to it as I thought. We're repeatedly bombarded with talk of 9/11. And as a country, I think we've healed. The difficult part to cope with this is the personal side of the story. Regardless of how nonchalantly we carry on with our day on September 11th with just brief moments of remembrance, it is impossible not to be moved by a big burly firefighter tearing up over the loss of his friend or a teen who has lost his mother but somehow finds a way to go on. When I heard the stories of the people in the film, I could not help but feel a swell of empathy. How are these individuals able to cope? How is it that they move forward with their lives while still remembering those they've lost? All I can surmise is that humans are much more resilient than we think. Hope can pull us through amazing tragedies, and that's just one of the beauties of the human spirit. Now I'm going to go off script taking the cue from my brother. 
I think we're long past the moment when we can pretend that going to university is just about the life of the mind. It has to be. We have to have the moral courage, courage to believe that this is a moment when it has to be about helping people open their hearts and activating their minds. Tanya says in the trailer, you can eventually open up your heart and let, let new love in. So I had students watching these wandering around, finding one of the interview subjects with whom they particularly identified, going deeper, gathering things that meant something to them, boiling down poignant moments to 30 seconds, just living inside the interview footage, giving them lots of room to experience the interior lives of the subject's recovery. And the final assignment for that class was that they had to pick three clips that they felt they could talk about in the context of what we'd explored as the rhetoric of trauma and put together what I had called at the time a listening guide to the tapes, the very tapes that we're bringing in the library today. So I want to end with one more uh, passage from a student in her listening guide to the three clips. And this is the same student who said, I thought I was over 9-11. So she writes this on the very last assignment of the class. These three clips of Tim, Tim the firefighter, these three clips of Tim are very limited and focused examples chosen to support the claim that trauma and the following processes of healing happen in a cyclical manner driven by human resilience. That is, traumatic events happen to people, people with definite identities. However, through the experience of suffering, these identities are often lost or questioned. The main struggle in any post-trauma narrative is the fight to define a new identity so the affected can once again feel whole as a person. Although the whole will not be a whole made up of the same parts that existed before the tragedy, the survivors will strive to piece together the portions of their former life that still make sense in conjunction with their new roles that help them cope. So if having these tapes in the library and available to educators can help more students open themselves in this way, then it's a truly precious gift. So thank you, Brian. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Bill Keegan, um, our final speaker for the evening. Uh, Bill is a 20-year veteran of the Port Authority Police Department. Bill served as the Night Operations Commander for the World Trade Center Rescue and Recovery Teams and was awarded the highest medal for his work in the post-9-11 recovery effort. His other awards include the 1993 World Trade Center Bombing Medal of Valor for his rescue of school children trapped in a stalled elevator, the Hanratty Medal of Valor, over 50 police duty medals, and is certified at the 400 level of the Incident Command System. In 2007, Bill founded Heart 9-11, a nonprofit disaster response organization comprised of police, fire, union construction workers, and 9-11 surviving families. And on a personal note, many years ago, I read Bill's book when it first came out called Closure and wrote to Brian immediately and said, this is the best book I've ever read about how to know what to do when nobody has any idea what to do. Um, and uh, have enjoyed getting to know Bill a little bit since then, including when he came down to speak to a class I was co-teaching with Maggie Little in 75 of the most riveting minutes I've ever had in a classroom. So it's a pleasure to introduce Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here at Georgetown. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Project Rebirth. Thank you to the Casey McElvan family for uh, throwing this um, event. I very much uh, appreciate being here in Georgetown. 
Um, yeah, so I'm a police lieutenant retired. And um, one of my last duties was as the night, night operations commander at the World Trade Center following the 9-11 attacks. Um, I was uh, able to supervise the, some of the finest human beings I've ever met in my life, professionals, to the core. And as uh, Professor Bass mentioned, uh, what do you do when you don't know what to do? And we figured it out. And the bond that we created amongst each other was uh, very strong. And I think that General Casey could attest to when you fight side by side with someone, um, that bond is very, very strong. But um, after the World Trade Center was over, the mission was over, and I spent the full nine months there, many of the professionals that I worked with retired. Pension calculation uh, being what it was forced them off the job. Frankly, they had to leave. They didn't want to leave, but they had to leave for their family's own well-being. Look real quick. Uh, your overtime is calculated into your final pension number. So they worked three times one year in one year. So they would have been coming to work for less money than they would make to stay home. Okay, well, many then went to work college education for their kids, always think of somebody else. Maybe their wife didn't have to go to work anymore. It forced them off the job. Some of the smartest, best uh, were let go. Um, when I retired in 2007, I had seen so many of these men and women had sort of fallen into a malaise because guess what? We don't do what we do for money. We do it because it's who we are. It's what we love doing, helping people on a day-to-day -day basis. You have no idea what the impact is on New York City cops when we're helping people which is what we do 95% of the time. So what do you do with that now? You used to be an ESU guy. You used to do these incredible things, the plane in the Hudson River. Now what do you do? <laughs> you take the little kids to kindergarten. You go to first grade. You talk to other moms. Um, so I started to recognize this malaise. And I said, you know, boy, wouldn't it be great if we were able to do on a voluntary basis what we used to do for a living. What if we kept the purity of the 9-11 experience that we bonded over and did it for free, did it for no money, just did it for the love of the job? Could I get people to do that? The response has been overwhelming. Thousands of cops, firemen, and construction workers that work down at the World Trade Center have now volunteered their time to go to disasters and mass casualty events. To what? To share their expertise and experience with other first responders and victims who are going through something similar like we went through. And by the way, we felt the love from around this country when we were down there. And it's our small way of paying it forward and thanking people for what they had done for us. Now, I didn't see it at the time way back when, but a guy was sitting in, we were just a small group at the time, and we're sitting there having a meeting, and I noticed a gentleman, Brian Rafferty, sitting close by, and he goes, go on with your meeting, I'll talk to you later. He had recognized that there was going to be this intersection between Heart 9-11 and Project Rebirth way before I did. I had no idea what a Hollywood producer and a film would have to do with cops and firemen that are trying to do this work. Brian did. And what is it? And this is, I'll be very brief. Here's what it is. They did a movie that depicts what people go through in a very personal way, contrasted against the demolition of a building. We watch people basically devolve, deconstruct right before our eyes as we watch the buildings fall. We then watch the buildings be built and we watch people build their lives back. That message needs to be shared. Similarly, Heart 9-11's message of resilience, the cops and firemen that work down there, the construction workers, we need to share our experiences, our expertise. How did we get through it? What were our strategies? How has it transformed us? How do you build a platform from this tragedy that helps you propel yourself to heights that you never would have been able to attain had you not gone through this? How does this make you better? How does this not anchor you? 
That's what we bring to people. Go down to, uh, well, I have teams in uh, Houston right now. I have teams on their way to Florida. I, I can't stop these guys. They love going to these things. And ultimately, when we get there, people look at us and go, but my God, you went through 9-11. It must be devastating. And we say, look at them. No. Helping you helps heal us. Doing this work is what makes us who we are. So this intersection between Project Rebirth and Heart 9-11 is something Brian saw a long time ago. And this film will change people's lives. This film will help inform who people will be as they grow. The empathy that Randy talks about is so important in someone's life. And as a police officer, I was, had to be divorced from empathy. I can't do my job well if I feel terrible about the victim. I've got to act professionally. Well, 9-11 took that from us because they were our friends. They were our family. It happened to us. And that awakened an empathy in us. And that's what we take forward. And it's so critical to the young minds of America that they understand this in a historical, epic, iconic event and how that can happen. So th thank you very much for your time. I'm going to uh, quarterback the questions. So if anybody has something to say or a question, let me know. Oh, sorry. I should have. Sure. Okay. Um, I just want to. I, 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 I am remiss because I should have introduced Dr. Cooper Smith. He is the director of Veterans Initiatives here at Georgetown. And in the back is Linnea Hensel. Please stand up and wave. She's the one who runs the Veteran Support Office here at Georgetown. Well, that's what I was going to say. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to say two words. It's a little bit complicated, but. Uh, General Casey, you, you, one of the main themes of your discussion was resilience. One of the main themes of your discussion was kind of the badness of desensitization. And yet we, we put those two together, that to have resilience you should be somewhat desensitized, when in fact it's the opposite. And what many people would be, I, I ran the medical research program for eight years and we spent a lot of time doing research on PTSD, and what many people think is that if you can somehow blunt yourself, you can get beyond this, when in fact those are the people who do the worst. And I think that's a very important point to make. I, I agree. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the pieces of resilience that, that I found, particularly um, well, both individual and organizational resilience, is thinking about what could happen, and mentally preparing yourself for what could happen. Uh, and that's not, that's not desensitization, but that's, that, that's preparation. Um, Jim, Jim Collins, who writes, uh, is a great, great business writer, talks about uh, productive paranoia. And these are executives that are always looking over their shoulder, worrying about what's going to happen next. And they don't wring their hands about it. They think about it. And they take, thing, they take actions to prepare themselves and the organization in the event something does happen. And, and that allows them to, to, to snap back after something bad happens, which is the basic, the basic definition of, of resilience. But again, it's not, it's not desensitization. I don't know, you want to pick up on that? And I, I would just like to, I, I had been up to Newtown with the police officers following the Sandy Hook shooting. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't get us up there until a year later, and we learned a new word from Dr. Stephen Southwick out of Yale, and that was concretization. And what happens is, is you become normal within this altered state, and you don't want to go back. And life is okay. Now, it's funny, when you talk to their kids, when you talk to their wives, or you talk to their husbands, they'll tell you something completely opposite but they've become okay with a life that is not full. 
and Dr. Southwick called it concretization. We had to break through that concrete before we could actually get to them to build resiliency. Yeah, and if I just follow up on that, back to the desensitization though, what I found is the hardest thing to do is to get soldiers who are suffering to talk about it. And you know, people always ask, what can I do? You can listen. You can ask them to tell their story and get it out because as you suggested, it's the ones who, who, who try to tough it out and keep it all inside that, that have the worst problems. This is interesting. One of the things that convinced me that I would keep punching away at this as I had for another 10 years was reading Bill's book, which then I said to Randy, and that maybe you could talk about this because this was, this was a moment for me when you describe the people working on the pile and with all the best intentions, the city government, FEMA, sending in psychologists to interview them while they were doing what they were doing to see if they were okay. And of course, everyone quickly sussed out if you didn't give the right answers to the psychologist, you would not be able to continue working. So they all gave the right answers. And to me, that was an example of good intentions, but not an understanding of when it, you should be desensitized or the simple fact that you need to finish the job. Yeah, Brian is uh, exactly right. That was one of the more difficult things is having people come from all over the country. Uh, and at what, and I, I'll say this, but I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Like you'll have somebody coming up from Alabama and I could barely understand them um, trying to figure out what, you know, how do I feel? And, you know, and, and they moved on and then you didn't see them for 10 nights and then they would cycle back through and they, oh no, God, here he comes again. Uh, um, and one night I'm standing down by the site and it was just when they were, I'm sorry about the phone, I thought I turned it off. But it, 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 I'm sitting there and it's just when we found out that the west wall of the bathtub was starting to move and that there was a real chance that it was gonna flood. And I didn't understand the, the engineering language and things and there was a woman standing next to me and she said, how long have you been here? I said, well, I've been here two weeks nonstop. Oh my God. She goes, when are you gonna leave? And I said, when the last body comes out of there a flip kind of comment that I made. And, and she looked at me and the next thing I knew there were 10 people standing in front of me with my boss and I was being removed from the World Trade Center. Um, he and I had a very frank talk. Um, and I convinced him that it would probably be better if I stayed, uh, which he allowed me to do to his credit. Uh, God bless him. And it went on, but that, that's the sort of thing I learned never to use the word, I'm fine. Never say you're fine. You know, just, just, just don't use those words. And, and I just learned not to talk, which I guess is what we're kind of getting at. Just don't talk to anybody and you'll be out of trouble. Uh, so. Well, and I, I think, you know, my perspective from education, though I hear it in what you're saying, it's, it's not about whether you're sensitive or not sensitive or whether you're protected in a situation. It's really about just constantly needing other people to help you find your own boundaries. Right? That sometimes you just have to do what you have to do, but you may not, you don't always know how aware you are. And I think from a student's standpoint or a young person's standpoint, people think they're alive to something in the world and they realize they actually aren't. Just like someone can be, think that they're okay, but they're not. I, I remember a story you told when you came down to class, and I hope I don't botch the details, but. Uh, or if I do, you don't say anything. But um, <laughs> but you told the story of uh, getting Chinese food one night, and uh, the bags where the bodies were in were red, I think, or something like that. And uh, so that was just burned into your mind. And you were at, in a restaurant, and you were waiting for your food, and there were people in front of you. And then all of a sudden, people parted, and there was your Chinese food in these red bags sitting on the counter. And, and it just hit you in a way that you, you didn't expect, uh, um, that, that made you realize you weren't doing okay. Yeah, um, yeah that was, a, it was really a, a, a moment that I, I hadn't, I, like so many people, PTSD um, is, is sort of a very difficult concept to get your head around and to figure out. And uh, I hadn't really figured it out, but I didn't think I would ever get it, and I wasn't so sure it was real. 
And there I was in a restaurant, and somebody had to move me to shake me out of this stair I was on. And I picked up the food, I paid for it, I got in my car, I drove to my home, I ate and everything else. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember anything about that. I remember waking up the next day and f thinking what happened. And that's how it, it first happened uh, to me, so it, it can. Um, and it's not debilitating, and that's part of what we're trying to say here, too, is, is that it, it can be worked with. It, 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 there's no sense to this. And, and the, the fear of losing a rank or losing your gun or badge as a cop or a firefighter being put offline, um, you know, something we really need to overcome because it, it, it's not debilitating and it can be worked with. Sorry, sir. I, normally, I'm the quiet one, but uh, you, you hit That's on That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to share an experience, uh, as I still refer to him as the boss. As the boss said, um, when I was injured and came out of Iraq, I did go back and finish my mission. You were talking about um, how difficult it is sometimes to get people to talk about their experience. And I'm not even sure if I've ever shared this with you, but what I tell everybody that I talk to about PTSD is that when I came out of Iraq, I was pretty banged up. I had a bunch of broken bones. I shattered my right shoulder. I was pretty immobile. But I had all my fingers and toes. And I, while I'm there on Ward 68 at Walter Reed, they're taking me down to this room to uh, do this group therapy session where I'm supposed to talk about my experience. And I go in there and I look around the room and I see people who are missing arms and legs and going through uh, much worse situations than I was going through. And the rest of this story is that we, we had literally been on the ground about three weeks when I got injured. We, I had not even, as his, at the time I was his communicator, we had not even been able to establish robust communications yet, and I got taken out. So at Walter Reed, I wasn't thinking about telling anybody my story. I just wanted to get back over there and finish my mission. Um, I think in retrospect, we both would agree that I went back way too early. What I learned out of that is that when you're going through something, you cannot compare your experience with the guy next to you. Your experience is your experience, and you have to be willing to talk about it to get it out. And if you don't do it, it'll be with you, and it'll never go away. So I always try to share that with everybody. Thank you. Can't top that. Okay. There was somebody over here. I have a question here. Um, I know, General Case, you talked about how um, the military, in, in the past at least, wasn't very focused on or prepared for addressing PTSD. It's also a huge, um, hugely underdiagnosed and underestimated problem when it comes to members of, of the public after disasters. And that's why I want to direct this question to you, Bill, because um, I, I have a background in, in disasters and in Hurricane Katrina. My community was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina, and I wrote a book about my hometown's recovery, and that's how uh, Brian and I connected. Um, so would you talk to me, Bill, about what you see in disaster zones when it comes to the anxiety, depression, PTSD, and, and if your folks who you bring down there to help, if they're able to use their experience to help the people that they are, while they're physically working on gutting and mucking out their homes, but to begin to help them to address that as well. Yeah, I, I, so one of the things I see right away is the uncertainty of people who have just had everything that they hold dear destroyed or taken away. I can't tell you the women that I met uh, down in, in Louisiana, uh, the biggest thing was the pictures. They were the, they were the, the caretakers of the family pictures that have been passed down, passed down, passed down. And they were destroyed by the fact that they didn't take care of them and that they allowed that to happen. Um, but where I think Heart 9-11 and where people we step in is, is that, like during Sandy, when we come in, we're the cops and firemen. They know us. They trust us. And that's what they're looking for. Where do I finally stop this fall down this cliff? Where's the branch I can finally hold on to? And what we found is we were that branch. And they would look at us and go, do I really need to get rid of the whole kitchen? Can I keep this? It's my kitchen. You've got to get rid of the whole kitchen. OK, well, the cops and firemen told me, and 
I believe them. And, and out it would go, because it would, it has to, it's mold, it, it would get everybody sickly. You need to get rid of it. They tell me that I only need to do this much. No, you really need to do the whole thing. We're looking out for your own safety. There's a bond there. And that's what I've found is, is that most people, their whole lives have been turned upside down. Their moral compass, their physical compass is gone. And they're looking for somebody to hold on to. The unfortunate is what I described with the uh, disasters, um, critical incident stress management type people and others, is that they're in and out. They're in and out. And you have nobody who you can really grasp onto. The other part is the grassroots community organizations are the best. All right, if you really want to make a difference, find a grassroots community organization that knows it. Uh, and you could pick them, moose clubs, elk clubs, lions clubs, uh, ancient order of Hibernians, the Italian club, the Polish American club, the, the VFW hall, the American Legion hall, just plug into those people because they know their community and they know the needs. And when you do that, you could really make a difference. And I think that that's how you build community. Then what we did is we established captains in each one of these little communities that could look out for people and get the resources to the people that they know needed it most. And again, that was very, so we're down in Texas now and we're plugged in. And I'm not all over Texas, but I'm in one community and we're gonna make a big difference in that community. And I think that that's what really matters is consistency and a trust is the two things I would say are most important following a disaster to the victims. Is there a difference? From the, the psychiatric or psychological standpoint, is there a difference for those suffering from PTSD or whatnot when the disaster is an act of God, Katrina, Harvey, Irma, and when another human being has inflicted the disaster on, on you. I'll, I'll defer to the clinical the clinician, Dr. Coopersmith. I, I, I can say something. Yeah. I'm actually a cardiologist, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there, <laughs> there is, a high, for, for the military, of course, as you know, there is a hyper-acute uh, awareness that they have as they go into battle which uh, mobilizes their various uh, you know, central nervous system and adrenaline and all that, which is very different from when somebody is hit by an accident that they didn't expect. So, and I, I think that most people think that there is a difference there, but as far as long-term clinical effects, they haven't found much, uh, much difference. Uh, so uh, I, I think, I think, uh, there's a group here that works a lot on PTSD and, uh, and uh, civilian PTSD, and they pretty much find the same thing that others do, mm -hmm. even though there are theoretical differences. There's also probably a genetic component to resilience that we were working on, which is another interesting feature of it. Mm. Yeah, you know, I mentioned uh, Dr. Marty Seligman from University of Pennsylvania was one of the people we, we reached out to, and, and he started down this with a concept called learn helplessness, and he would test people and, and, and the results would be a bell curve and there were, he tried to get people to be helpless. Well, there was a group that uh, on one end that, that he'd never move. They, they were just resilient to begin with. And then there was a group at the other end when they said, boo, they collapsed. And then you have everybody in the middle. So that's the, peop, some people are just more resilient than others and it, it may be genetic. Thank you so much, really extraordinary discussion. I have two questions. The first is, um, I'm so pleased that we're having this, um, this veterans program here at Georgetown, and um, I'm just a travel bias since I teach here, um, but I believe the extraordinary diversity of education that we have here really will make an important contribution. And that ranges from what is being done at the medical center uh, in terms of the intersection between medicine and the arts, visual arts, poetry, a theater, et cetera, um, to what we're doing in terms of researching in uh, qualitative methodology. And essentially, this is qualitative methodology uh, brought to film. It's really storytelling. And I wonder um, how you're planning to go about ensuring that the various intersections that we have at Georgetown are going to be Use, so how you're going to be doing re 
outreach to um, faculty and students. And then I have another question. Oh, you want to ask, want me to answer that question? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah you <laughs> don't just get to moderate. No, <laughs> I know. Well, um, it's for all of you. You know, where this started here, um, it's Jack's on the board, and he showed an early version of the content, I think, over 10 years ago now to a group of faculty mm -hmm. and said, and I was still trying to figure out, I knew this was important, but what is the best thing to do with it? And he, uh, and he showed this to this group and said, well, is this, is this useful and how could it be useful? And I think, Randy, you were there. And I think, Jen Willard, you were there as well, right? And so um, the number of, of people who came up and said, look, this is really valuable. This is a gold mine of content was one of the things that said, okay, you've just got to keep punching. But not only is the university environment very complicated, but going back to the earlier question about how people react, whether it's a man-made disaster or an act of war, everyone is different, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the only way that I've figured out is, as Randy was saying, I just keep moving. And I keep putting it in front of people and saying, how can we help? And I try and put people together to say, um, you know, how can I assist you to find common goals to, 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 to go forward? Um, and it's the only way I figured out to... Now, it's an interesting question, though, from the veterans' student point of view here, because I believe the veterans have a huge amount to bring to the university and to the world as far as the strengths that they bring. And because the veteran, and maybe Linnea, you should answer this question, but the veteran student body here, 900,000? Um, so, and that's, and that's all across how many? That's across all of the schools. So I have this view that just as veterans, because of General Casey's leadership in large part, took the lead and first responders in actually grappling with this exceptionally difficult problem, that the, one of the things we've tried to do is facilitate veterans bringing the message to first responders, because first responders will not listen to me. Why should they? I'm a guy in a suit. But they will listen to somebody who said, I've been to Iraq, I've been through this, and you better listen. Like they will listen to Bill when he talks to fellow first responders. So where I'm getting to is I have a view that the veteran students at Georgetown can be a across the system um, advocate for for helping with this content. And I'm gonna hand it over to Randy because one of the things we've talked about is the commonalities between building on the strengths of veterans and dealing with the challenges they have and, and how that works for almost every other group of people that come into this school that frankly aren't rich white kids. Yes, as a, I, I, I think there's sort of two answers to your question, Irene, of which Brian's answered both of them, but um, really, <laughs> yeah, I was just stumbling around. <laughs> you did beautifully. Um, one is that it's been really many years since we've done a sort of outreach with the faculty. I mean, really, the last time that we kind of were shopping around campus and looking for places to engage faculty with these materials, the feature film wasn't out. We didn't have a good platform for people to access the interviews. I mean, it was really ahead of its. Yeah. moment to do this so this occasion and the bringing them into the library is, is this is really the right time because now yeah. we have everything we need to to bring them forward so first of all I'm very committed to to doing that and was talking to folks beforehand about that but I love this idea of using it as a way to actually engage veterans with the community on a very broad scale and uh, and and not and let them not feel like it's all about us providing them something that they should be grateful for, but that we should be grateful for their presence for helping to enrich how it is we even receive these materials. And I think it's a great opportunity to do that, and I'd, I'd love to explore that in the next few months. Yeah, I, if I, I could, but they're, they're, they're also looking for ways to give back and to continue to give yes. back. Yeah. And so I, I've already thought of three different courses. Um, in which the film could be used, and I think the veterans should be guest speakers. Joe, jo, get, get her name. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I ask my second question? Yeah. Um, this, I'm not exactly certain how to phrase this, 
and it probably is going to be a bit controversial, but I'll ask it anyway. That's good. I like that. Um, so I do quite a bit of work in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, in part with funding from the Department of State. And um, some of it um, has to do with biosecurity, biosafety, bioethics, responsible science, all of that. Mm -hmm. And some of it has to do with kind of the opposite of adolescent um, violence. So it's um, adolescent and youth engaged in peace building. And this film really can speak to that. And I'm wondering if in addition to showing the film and in engaging in work in disaster response in the United States, if you have thought about taking this message of caring for one another and resilience to other parts of the world, including the Middle East and North Africa. We have not taken it. We actually have um, been asked and hosted by the State Department post-tsunami in Japan. Um, and the answer is there's nothing more we would like to do than that. And one of my unfinished missions is if you look at the nine people, they are about as diverse as you can get. And there's one in particular, there's a few stories that I very much love, but that um, as a concept of what really makes up New York and how New York recovered from this without violence, without turning on each other. And the, the good news of how, how this city that was a melting pot and is still a melting pot took this tremendous blow and rebuilt without turning on themselves. Yeah, we argue a lot. We're New Yorkers. But the city also allowed people to grieve. They allowed the time to grieve where the press was saying, oh, you know, it's a big hole in the ground. Well, we couldn't, as a city, couldn't decide. And when you see the footage, you see the buildings actually, the site start to change as you see the subjects beginning to reach a level of awareness and growth. So, so the answer is there are so many possibilities to show different types of the different types of people here. I mean, Debbie Almenthalzer is a, a Syrian Muslim American immigrant who was a teacher on 9-11 and um, whose son was at the site in the National Guard and came back suffering the trauma of what he did and saw at the site while she was hiding in the back seat of her car because she was scared for the reaction because she, she wore a head covering. So, and there, there's layers and layers and layers of that. But in fact, um, you know, she's she, she's out advocating for tolerance and understanding uh, today. So there's huge potential for that. But that's that's pe people have to pick up the ball and carry it because, you know, um, I'm me. <laughs> and, well, and if I could just add briefly yeah, to that, I, I know yeah, we're getting short on time. Too. And, I, I, I'm sort of vague on the details, so you might be able to fill it in, but it, there was an extraordinary event on campus. I think the Berkeley Center helped organize it, called the Parent Circle, perhaps? That was, yes, yeah, yeah. Parents of Israeli and, pa Israeli children. and Palestinian parents who have both lost children in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And the 17-minute trailer yeah. was shown, and then this very intense, amazing discussion about the capacity of trying to understand what it looks like uh, from the other side to to grieve, et cetera, and it really elicited, you know, an extraordinary and not not simply a kumbaya dialogue. I remember there were some difficult moments in that dialogue, but it was a great dialogue that the film elicited in a very different context. And and just on, our, I've been to Haiti uh, since the 2010 earthquake about 20 times, and we built a lot of things in Haiti. Um, and one of the things that they didn't understand, the Fajwa school system, uh, we built a complex there on a Jesuit property. And um, one of the things they didn't quite understand is like who we really were. And when the Jesuits explained to them who we were and what we had been through, their eyes changed. They changed, they touched us. They wanted to know more. And it was really on an emotional level of what they had just been through with the 2010 earthquake, that that connection was made. So on a much different level, and, and, and what we were doing is teaching them how to build apprentice programs and things like that. So there was the connection. So I, I, I clearly see that it would work 
uh, internationally and in different, it doesn't have to be at a, a, a university. Because we all go through grief, guaranteed, we all die, and trauma. And so when I became engaged in this, it was very early on and things were very difficult and very sensitive and they still remain so today. But one of the reasons we were able to pr prosper and survive in that environment was remaining apolitical and focusing on this is about the strength of human beings and the human spirit in the face of disaster. And that that is something that, that binds us. So that's been something that's, that, that's kind of kept me punching <laughs> through all mm. these years. So thank you for that question. That's a great question. And I'm afraid we are out of time for more questions, unfortunately. I, I don't often find myself with not much to say, but this is one of those times. The fact that we think of ourselves as being resilient, but also empathetic when tragedy, when disasters, resonate with all of us is something I think that you brought to us this evening in a very meaningful and um, empathetic, if I can use the word again, way. I'm proud and pleased that the University Library will be supportive of this project for pedagogy, but for anybody in the public to be able to look at some of these materials and understand better what these four people have been telling us tonight. I feel as if I've led a very ordinary life, by contrast. <laughs> and knowing the work that you four are doing, and that the veterans at Georgetown, and the Jesuit community, and the pedagogy and research that go on at Georgetown, makes me feel even prouder that we have all of you, and all of the work that all of you have access to, because of what this university is. I've often thought that the library is the center of the universe, <laughs> and um, perhaps it will be the center of empathy and resilience, and teach us all that the ordinary lives that some of us think we live really can be enhanced by understanding other people's lives themselves. So let me ask you, again, to thank the members of the Casey McElvain family, Frank, Tom and Nancy for providing us the venue for this. And thanking Brian Rafferty, General George Casey, Randy Bass, and Bill Keegan, not only for the presentation that they've given us tonight, but for the truly extraordinary work that they're doing for all of us, for this country, and probably for the world. Thank you, more than I can say. Thank you, Emily Menton. Thank you, Katie Thomas. Thank you, library staff, for everything that you've done. Salva Ismail and Suzanne Chase for providing the wonderful resource that is Project Rebirth. And continue this conversation over food and drink at the reception. Thank you all for coming.